Good morning. My name is Oda Letts. I am the lead of the K-12 education group at JPL. And with me this morning is my colleague, Leslie. Leslie, what do you do? I'm here in the JPL education office as well. I specialize in formal education and been working a lot with after school programs and camps. Awesome. All right. So I'm looking at our, our poll and it looks like the grade levels of our mm -hmm. folks are all over the place, which is fantastic. Um, let's see, I think I can share results with everyone here. Um, looks like we have a little bit of everything with most folks in the upper elementary or middle school. That's wonderful. Um, and looks like we have a variety of types of programs. Some of you are doing in-person, some of you are doing virtual or at home, and some of you are doing a hybrid. Uh, very cool. We're, we have stuff for all those environments, so that's wonderful. And we also have things for every grade level. Um, and looks like your experience is kind of all over the map too, which is great. Um, those of you who have done it for a while, Feel free to chime in in the in the chat with your with your wisdom and advice. Um, and those of you who are are new to it and having if you have questions, looks like we have quite a number of people who have experience who might be willing to share their their advice. So feel free to pop your questions in. Um, just so you know that you can enter your questions in the Q and A or conversation into the chat. Um, we'll be Looking at both of them, uh, my colleagues Amelia and Joyce will be monitoring those for us. And um, we will try to help you with any question that comes up. So feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, the questions that you type into the chat and the Q&A won't be uh, visible in the recording, but we will be reading them and that will be in the recording. So, all right. I I'm can just add. Yes. that um, it's really an honor to be here um, because you guys are the ones out there inspiring the kids and helping them grow. And um, it's just an honor to be able to help you do your job and help bring some excitement and, and some real skills in into the kids that you serve. So just a thank you. Yes, agreed. You, you folks have the hard jobs. Uh, we try to help make your job a little bit easier but we know that you're, you're doing the, the heavy lifting around here. So uh, mm -hmm. thanks for the work you do. You, you really do make a difference in the lives of our young people and, and it's a very valuable contribution. So we have this thing called the Mission to Mars Student Challenge and we did it in uh, January, February and March uh, during the, the lead up to the landing of the Perseverance Rover. And we had such a demand from the out of school time community that we decided to do a summer camp edition. So there's a lot of our out of school time folks are saying, oh yeah, this will be really fun to do as a camp in the summer. And we're like, hey, you're right. Let's uh, see what we can do to support you. So uh, the big idea of the Mission to Mars Student Challenge is that you would be leading students in designing and building a Mission to Mars um, and we give you the education plan and lessons and activities, and games, all sorts of stuff, videos, interactives, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and if you haven't found it already, it's at the website noted on this slide, go.nasa.gov slash Mars challenge. Um, our goals are to engage youth in all 50 states and all our territories and around the world would be lovely because that's uh, we want to get as many kids involved as want to be. Um, we're really interested in targeting our underserved communities, uh, especially during this time with the pandemic. We know that a lot of our underserved communities have uh, really struggled and we think this could be something that would give them some uh, something really fun to focus on and uh, develop their skills in a, in a really fun interactive environment. And then of course, you know, a little bit of self-serving, we wanna bring attention to our, our Mars mission. Um, so we're, we're, we have this seven week plan. Um, the, the lessons vary, whether we have K2, 3, 5, 
6, 8, and 9, 12. So some of them cross grade bands. Some of them are only going to be appropriate for the K2s. Um, so we have a, a, a whole gamut of lessons and we'll be through this series showing you uh, a number of those. Um, and we are, we're going to be leading students through um, learning about Mars, planning a mission, launching, landing, and then exploring the surface. Um, we have a series of one hour, one hour webinars for you folks, and I'll show you that schedule bri briefly. Um, and then we also have some question and answer sessions for your, for your youth who will be able to uh, interact with some of our subject matter experts. Uh, this will be in June and July. And I'm going to chime in here and just say that um, across all these trainings, we've kind of got a range of styles, um, different environments that you can do these in, different um, types of activities for the kids, you know, from hands on to programming language to stuff you can do inside and outside. So we're trying to get you across cutting look at different ways to implement these. Yeah. And uh, Carol, I see your comment in the chat. You've seen the the paper helicopter activity <laughs> and that's wonderful. I, I really appreciate that feedback. Um, so we do have a bunch of how-to videos out there um, and here's, here are, is our plan for you, the leaders. So today we're um, focusing on activities that are called, it's called uh, Learning About Mars, it's called Art, Art and the Cosmic Connection. And yes, Sai, I see your question, we are going to draw today. Um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to do another webinar that is going to focus on planning your mission and it'll feature different activities. And then a couple of weeks after that, we'll focus on designing your spacecraft and yet another set of featured activities. Then June 10th will be surface operations, June 17th, sample handling. And again, each of these will feature different activities. And then mid July, which we figure you're probably going to be in the middle of your program or maybe just beginning, uh, depending on where you are, maybe even wrapping up, but we're calling it a midsummer check-in where we hope that you will come and share what you've learned, maybe even share some of your student work and um, give uh, kind of a, a, a hints and tips for success sharing session. And so we really wanna hear from you at that point. Uh, and then the, as I promised, the sessions for your youth, um, June 23rd, uh, we will have a session for youth to ask questions about generally as they're learning about Mars. Um, and then June 29th, we'll be um, asking questions about planning their mission. July 8th, questions about designing their spacecraft. And each one of these is going to feature one, a, a NASA education host and a subject matter expert. So a, a scientist or engineer who actually works on the Perseverance mission. Um, July 14th, they'll get to ask questions about launching, July 19th about landing, and then July 27th about surface operations and sample handling. So there, there's a lot of fun stuff planned and I hope it'll be uh, helpful to you folks. Um, Leslie, what does it take to uh, do a STEM enrichment activity for NASA? It doesn't take experience. You guys can do this. Um, I noticed in the poll that there's a, a good number of you who, you know, it's a regular part of what you do, you know, to lead STEM activities. So I'm super excited that, that that's the case. And I'm hoping over the course of these times, that you guys can help each other out, those who have experience and those who are just beginning. Um, and we're trying to set this up so you are the guide on the side. You're not the sage on the stage, you know? So you help direct your kids in learning. That's your main um, objective and you learn too. And what really helps is if you're excited, enthusiastic about what you're presenting because the kids will pick up on that too. And we hope that we can bring some of that to you today. Um, the basic um, things that we use to design the materials is, you know, not make them school-like, of course, in this case, for after school, we want them to um, um, 
have off the shelf materials, uh, not too many worksheets, um, things that uh, allow you to get creative, um, things that are very hands-on, um, use different skills. Um, like today, we're going to do a right brain and left brain activity um, and bring some of that STEAM element into it. Um, so, and of course, above all else is, you know, the element of being safe in, in whatever you do with these things. The basic idea of the activity we're going to do today is that um, you are going to be able to help your kids and yourself for that matter, because I learn something every time I do this, develop the observation skills um, uh, that both scientists and artists need to use and also just happen to learn about the surface of Mars while you're at it, trying to understand how it applies to a current mission that's going on, the Mars 2020. Um, so I'll take a quick moment and ask you guys to go to the chat and tell me A, B, or C, if you wanna to go to the next slide there, Oda, um, do you have your supplies today? Because we're designing these trainings for you to do the activities along with us. We think that helps you um, be able to um, have confidence when you go to deliver them with the kids, if you get a chance to be walk through it and see what it is. So we're gonna do a little bit of that. And yes, we are going to do some drawing today. And for those of you who would like to share at the end, we're gonna do that too. So. Um, looks, ooh, we got a lot of prepared people. All right, I'm seeing A's and B's, I love it. Um, and the supplies are shown there right on the screen. Um, you, can, you can use any kind of um, drawing device that you would like. Markers, if you're really into art, you can go to pastels um, and a piece of paper. You can use crayons, colored pencils, um, it's up to you to decide what, what'll work for, you know, where you are today. So, um, <clears throat> good. Most people have supplies. That's good because we're going to spend some time being creative today. I'm really glad about that. Um, so I'm going to tell you really quickly on the, on the next slide then, um, before I do, I want those of you who said you can get them together in a couple minutes, go do it, but keep us on volume. Um, so uh, what I want to tell you right now is, um, you know, why Mars? Why are we doing this now? What's so exciting and interesting about focusing on Mars uh, this, this particular summer? So, you know, the timeline that we've had for this Mars 2020 mission has been going on for many, many, many years in the design phase and in the, you know, the science phase, um, scientists trying to determine what it is they wanna learn about Mars uh, because that's what drives everything in NASA is we wanna learn something. Um, it isn't just to go do it um, unless we're trying a new technology. So um, we chose um, the landing sites um, like five years ago, four or five years ago um, after careful consideration. And we'll talk a little, we'll get into that a little bit more as we go through. Um, then they actually designed, built, and um, had a contest to name the rover, which was named Perseverance. And that name couldn't be more timely or perfect, I think, because that's what we're all been having to do in the last year or so, is have a lot of perseverance and keep going. And also that's a skill I'm sure that you want to develop in your kids. Um, we launched last July. We um, had been cruising to Mars until February when we had the landing. And then um, now we're in the surface operation phase and Oda's gonna tell you a little bit more about what's in, involved, including um, a, the first helicopter to ever fly in another world. So um, I'll turn it over to Oda now, tell you a little bit more about the mission. All right, thanks, Leslie. Um, the this mission is really amazing with its objectives. So as usual, we are looking at the geology, the rocks on the surface of Mars, um, because we want to know a little bit about how Mars was formed and whether it is still geologically active. And uh, we know that there used to be water on the surface. 
Uh, we still have questions about how much and whether there is still some water under the surface or if it's all frozen and permafrost. So we have a lot to learn about the geology of Mars. Uh, we do a lot of comparison between Mars and Earth. Uh, we believe that they were similar when they were formed, though Mars is half the size of Earth. We think that it had a global ocean, uh, but now it doesn't have a global ocean. So what happened? Uh, and what can we learn from what has happened on Mars uh, for here on Earth? We also have an objective of astrobiology, which is looking for signs of ancient microbial life. And I, and I say microbial because we're not looking for little green men. We are looking for uh, anything that it, we think if life existed on Mars, it was probably microbes, little, little, little bug kind of things, not really bugs, but microbes, little, little things. And we um, were looking to see, because if, if we find out that Mars harbored life, that would be like super cool. And if Mars didn't harbor life, that's really interesting. Like why not? Um, another thing we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be uh, sample caching, which is kind of this obscure term, but what it means is we are going to be drilling, we're, we're drilling into rocks, taking core samples about the size of a piece of chalk and we're going to be uh, putting them in these hermetically sealed tubes, so airtight tubes, and dropping them on the surface of Mars for retrieval someday. Now we haven't figured out how we're gonna go get them, but the idea is we're going to go get them someday and bring them back to Earth for analysis. We have some science instruments on the rover itself, uh, but we don't have as many science instruments as we do here uh, on Earth. So we want to bring samples back so we can do some real analysis of, uh, of the surface of Mars. And all of this is um, hopefully going to give us an opportunity to uh, explore using humans someday. Uh, we have an instrument on the surface right now that's making oxygen, which is kind of cool because we need oxygen to breathe. So we hope we'll be able to explore uh, the surface of Mars um, with humans. Um, so February 18th, we landed. Uh, we landed this big rover, which is about the size of a small SUV. Uh, and uh, we used this big parachute, which had a, a fun uh, code embedded into it. It was a binary code that uh, um, gave the latitude and longitude location of JPL and our and indicated our slogan, which is Dare Mighty Things. Um, so this rover landed uh, in this place called Jezero Crater. And on, its, uh, on the rover's belly was a helicopter, which you may have heard about. Um, this little helicopter is only about four pounds in weight. And it's got these big rotors that spin really, really fast, like five times as fast as uh, an earthbound helicopter, because the uh, air on Mars is really thin. It's only like 1% of the atmosphere here on Earth. So if we had a 100 mile an hour wind on Earth, you know, all of our, our hair would be everywhere, things would be flying. Uh, on Mars, it might, you know, stir up some dust, but it would barely disturb your hair. Um, so there's just not that much air. So flying in that little bit of air is tough but we've been able to do it. So um, just uh, in the last couple of weeks, we have had the first helicopter flights on another world. So this is the first time we've ever been able to do a powered controlled flight on another planet. So uh, this picture, you can see the helicopter sitting on the surface of Mars. Um, you can even see some of the rover's tracks because the rover dropped off the helicopter and then drove away turned its cameras toward the helicopter and is filming the whole shebang. Um, this is the video from the second flight. Um, we're expecting the third flight today, as a matter of fact, but you can see the video here. You can see the helicopter take off, fly up. It's flying about 10 feet into the air on this particular flight. And then you're gonna see it take a, a little pan to the side and it's gonna go out of frame, but it's gonna come back because it's gonna come back and, and land at that same spot. So this, uh, this particular um, uh, 
vehicle, this, this helicopter is named Ingenuity. Um, Ingenuity and Perseverance were named by school kids in an essay contest. Um, and I think they chose really good names. So here's Ingenuity coming back and going to land and Ingenuity will just drop down and land gently on the surface. Uh, we do have pictures that the helicopter took from orbit and that's pretty cool too. Um, but you can take a look at that um, on, on your own. Just go to the Mars website, which is mars.nasa.gov. Uh, we've been sending rovers since the late 1990s. We've had orbiters, uh, we had landers even back in the 1970s. So this is just the latest in a long series of exploration vehicles to Mars. Um, as I mentioned, we know that we had water. We wanna know what happened to the water. Um, and we want to know whether uh, life did exist. We know that life could have existed, uh, but we don't know if it did exist on Mars. So Leslie is going to talk to us a little bit about biosignatures. And uh, Leslie, what is a biosignature? Okay. Um, a biosignature is a... a, a substance or a pattern that um, can only be created by something that's alive. So even if it's not currently alive, it might have left a trace um, of something that indicates that it was a living thing and able to change its environment and able to reproduce and stuff like that. So it could be patterns in the rocks, um, which is really what we look to as a, as a fingerprint. Um, so uh, unlike any Mars rover before, 2020 has the tools to look for this uh, fingerprints and map the, uh, signatures, and um, that'll help us understand where the rock came from and some hi more history about Mars. So that's what we're gonna be hunting for. Now I'm going to transition on the next slide to talking to you about some of the landing sites that scientists were considering. Each of these was a potential landing site um, and our actual images from the surface of Mars taken from one of those orbiters. So when Oda was talking about the different ways that we've explored Mars, the, um, that we take pictures from different places. When we saw on the surface, right, we um, had the rover taking a picture of the helicopter. Those were taken from the surface. And so they had a look that's very familiar to what we see when we're walking around Earth in terms of the angles that we see. If you're orbiting, um, if you guys have ever seen photos of the Earth from above or um, weather maps or, you know, things like that, cloud movements, you know, that's taken from a satellite. And the satellite has a very different and helpful perspective. And so are all these images they were taken of Mars from orbiting satellite called Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it has a super strong camera on it so that it can zoom in to places and um, help us understand what they're like before we try to decide where to land. Not some of the things that are important in considering where to land is, is it safe? Can you land there? Will you get um, caught on a rock? Um, will you end up on your side and not be able to write yourself? Things like that. Um, then there's also the scientific value of where you're trying to look. Did it have liquid water at some point? Because that's one of the requirements as far as we know it today for life. So we want to know Mars has had liquid water flowing on its surface in the past. So we want to target one of those areas if we're going to be looking for life. Um, do the rocks show signs of once being in those conditions, um, you know, near the water? Uh, are they the type of rocks that can preserve the past signs of life? Um, and have they been changed over, over the time since, since they were last, um, last affected by water? And another important for, thing for human exploration is, are there water resources Near there that might be used in the future for, for when we might send humans to the land. So um, these were the potential uh, considerations that scientists had to put together. And they used these images as well as other images to figure out 
and um, scientifically decide which place they need to go to. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that the winner is a, a place called Jezero Crater. And um, this actual image on the left-hand side is a false color, we call it representation of Jezero Crater. crater uh, the, the crater you can see is round um, and it's deeper, that's indicated by the blue color. The higher lands are indicated by the greens and yellows. So you can see there's a higher rim around the crater, which is real typical. And then within the crater, um, it, it uh, is much lower. So that is another indication of potential impact that was made um, many, 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 many uh, years ago. Um, we also have, you can see some channels flowing into it. And um, just like on earth, when water flows, it carries the loose material. Um, and then when the flow eases, it drops the material. Um, onto the side, and we call that a delta, for example, like the Mississippi River Delta. And the scientists wanted to be able to explore in and around that delta um, because it would br bring representative materials and have made deposits into um, that area. So as you can see, um, the uh, images show that Mars 2020 landed just right where they wanted to, the little uh, black uh, oval in the first image has the landing target area. And they sure did make it into that amazing feat. And the cameras on MRO are strong enough to be able to take pictures of all the parts of the spacecraft as it landed. Not only the, the lander, but the parachute, um, the back shell that, that, that was protecting it, um, all kinds of parts and pieces that we know are there. It's pretty darn amazing. And they did a terrific job. They had software on board that would look at the land below and make adjustments on its own to figure out where the best place to touch, touch down is. So that's pretty, pretty cool. So this leads us into, on the next slide, um, the actual art activity. Um, so I hope you got your um, supplies handy. First thing we're gonna do is learn a little bit about um, the elements of art and how that applies to the surface of Mars. And for that matter, the surface of earth and any other solid body that we have um, in, in the solar system. The moon, for example, you can draw a lot of conclusions just by looking at the art elements that are there. And of course, um, this can include the shapes. So, so for example, looking at the lines that appear in an image, um, the shapes, uh, the color that is used, whether it's the actual color or one that scientists might add to help them understand something better, the value, which means is how light and dark it is, and then the texture. We can't feel the surface of Mars from orbit, but we can make, um, assessments about how rough or smooth, for example, that surface might be. And of course, in landing, that's very, very important. All right, on to the next slide. Um, if you will um, take a look at this slide, you will see um, how scientists and geologists and artists can associate um, the shapes together. So for example, if one of the favorite and most obvious is if you see a nice clean circular shape, kind of like we saw in the Jezero crater, chances are that's an impact crater, something coming in and um, hitting the surface and leaving this circular shape. If you see uh, a shape that's more blobby, <laughs> to use the technical term, um, it might be a volcano or in the case of Earth or some other planet, uh, moons actually, it could be an, a lake. Uh, but on Mars, we don't have current water, so most likely it's going to be a volcano. Um, then you also um, have straight lines, which means similar to earthquake faults here on Earth, things are moving on the surface. Things are changing relative to each other, coming together, sliding against each other, moving apart. Um, they call that tectonic activity. 
then if there's squiggly lines, that's usually a sign of some kind of er erosion, whether it be liquid or uh, wind can cause all these wonderful patterns. And then I mentioned the, the color and the value and, and the texture. So what I'd like to do now is move you guys into actual activity. And I'm going to put in the chat here um, a URL for you to go to. First thing we wanna do is to get you practicing how to associate these um, shapes with images on Mars. So we have a quiz. Um, this activity that I've given you the URL to, I want you to go to section four and um, it, you will see in section four, explore Mars with our online quiz. Since we're doing this online and since some of you will be doing things with your kids online potentially, and um, we wanna give this option to trying to understand um, how to associate the shapes and the art concepts with different features on Mars. So I'm gonna ask you guys to go to that URL and I'm gonna give you a few minutes um, to start working through the quiz. Um, and I'll be here for any questions that you might have. Um, just if you're having issues, um, you can let us know in the chat if, there are um, questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll answer them if we, if we can. And uh, Oda, maybe what you could do is leave up the um, slide number 19 um, so that we can, they can refer to the shapes. Because I know, what, thank you very much. Um, as you're going through the quiz, you will see that um, you'll have to remember the associations of these shapes with what they are. Um, I see uh, one person says that it's not working for them. Perhaps you want to try a different browser, Lucas? Okay, where's the link? I'm gonna repost it here in the chat. And you'll find when you go through this quiz, I don't expect you to be able to finish it in, the, in this few minutes that we have, but I wanted you to get familiar with how it works um, and be able to think while you're doing it, you know, how will the kids, um, how will the kids be able to manage with this and what help you need? Um, I'm mentioning in there that you want to go through step four. Mm -hmm. And it says Mars quiz. The, the URL that I gave you is an integrated look at all a lot of the activities we're talking about today and includes both Earth and Mars. You're welcome, Elizabeth. Well, Lucas, I'm sorry to, to see that you're having difficulties. Um, I, I'm afraid I'm a little lost as to what to suggest. It might be a URL blocking or, or uh, your browser version or something like that, um, because it looks like most people are able to get to it. Leslie, just, I have a suggestion for Lucas. Oh, oh, oh. Um, Lucas, if you could just go yeah. into one of your browsers, just any browser and do a search for JPL Explore Earth and Space with Art, that should give you uh, a link that you could access. That's great. Thank you, Oda. I'm gonna give you guys another minute. You'll be able to come back to this. You might wanna bookmark it um, while you're there. I wanted to mention a couple of things while you were progressing. And that is that um, we do um, have a 
card game version of this matching in the works. So um, if that is useful, you think that would be useful to you to actually have a file that you can download and print um, and uh, with instructions for the game, um, please go ahead and um, type affirmatively in, in the chat and I can try to move that up on my to-do list <laughs> to get that out. It's been on it for quite a while. Um, great, I see someone completed. That's great. Um, the other thing I wanted uh, to mention is that I'm hoping we can do a younger kids version of this as well. That's, that's in the works. Yes, 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 that's Francis and I thinking very similar on that. I like to adapt the language for younger students. Mm -hmm. And maybe those of you who are having trouble, um, type in your um, browser and computer type and we'll take a look uh, for future use um, to see if we can, you know, make sure there's not something in there that's uh, causing troubles for certain situations. Okay, I see there's a couple of you. Leslie, would you like me to uh, quickly navigate over to that web page and show how to do it? Uh, sure, we can do that really quick. Okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, some people are on a Chromebook. Okay. Yeah, it could be things being blocked. Yeah, and that, that unfortunately is probably a, a setup in your own, own situation that you might have to work out with whoever manages your equipment. Yeah, a lot of people are doing, doing well with it, so. Yeah, so when you get to step three, which is take the quiz, that's the earth version of it. Mm -hmm. And if you go to step four, there's an, another quiz, which is the one we're referencing, which is Explore Mars with Art. If you click next, it'll give you options. You can read the, uh, the paragraph and then select whether you think it's the red tan image on the left or the black and white image on the right. I happen to think it's the one on the right. So if I click that and then hit next, it'll tell me if I'm right or wrong and it will give an explanation and then you can keep going to next and so on and so forth. It should give you the next question. Odo, we're not seeing your screen, by the way. Oh, you're not? No. Oh, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> share your screen. Oh, well, that's okay. a good explanation. <laughs> yeah, that's, I uh, guess it's still too early in the morning for me. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, over here on the right side of, this, of the activity, you can, you can jump to take your skills to Mars. Um, and I already did the first question and I, uh, um, I can back up to it and can back up some more than that. If you, when you started, it looks like this and you have to choose, you read the little paragraph and then you have to choose. I chose the black and white image on the right and then hit next. It gives you feedback and then, um, you can hit next again for the next question. And um, I'm just going to guess because I'm not even going to read and see if I get it right. And <laughs> oh, I guess wrong. And but you it need to read. Me, I know I should learn. <laughs> and so you can keep scrolling through it like that. Thanks for that demo. And at the end, um, if you want, it'll show you also your your kind of um, level of what you did. I think we assigned ten points to each each grade. So I want to move on to the next uh, slide, slide 21, actually, to help us interpret the images that uh, we see. You guys have gained some skills, I hope, here just in five minutes. I mean, it's pretty amazing. I hope you'll agree that just by understanding that there is um, a, a correlation between shapes and other concepts of art and what you see in an image, um, geologically, um, you can already tell what's going on on the surface. So I think, you know, you guys are really ready to put this to the next step, which is the looking at an image that has lots of different features in here. 
And so um, I'd like for you to type into the um, chat there what features that you see. Um, I'm going to ask you to take a little leap and not tell me the shapes, but to tell me the features that you see in this, in this image here. All right. Squiggly lines. Excellent. Excellent. In that case, you'll remember that indicates some kind of erosion. In this case, it is water flow. Circles. Okay, what do the circles mean? Craters. Wonderful. You guys got it. Yeah, so uh -huh, the coloration means changes in elevation. Very good. We've got some straight lines at the top left. That is wonderful observation. That's a very fine detail. Um, this, that means there's some kind of change in the Earth's surface, some spreading or some coming together or shifting. And I said Earth, Mars, um, some tectonic activity. You guys are extremely good observers. There's blobs and yes, those are volcanoes. So already I think you have a sense for what this image of Mars is telling us. And if you have more time, you can take a look at it. Um, it is in your quiz and you can see start to think to yourself, what is the progression? Which things happened first and which things came later? If you see a crater on top of a volcano, excuse me, on a plane, you probably know the plane was there first and then the, the crater came and, and messed up the surface. And similarly with water, if there's a crater on top of an old flow, you can get an idea of the progression of things just by looking and observing very carefully. All right. Thank you guys for playing along. Let's jump into activity two. This is where you're gonna get to use your artistic skills. What I'm gonna suggest is that you, um, I've got another slide in just a minute that has several images you can choose from. You can go back to the slide, um, back to the quiz and pick one of those that you wanna draw or I put a URL in the chat that you can click on and that has a beautiful set of images for you to choose from or just Google NASA Mars images and find whatever you'd like there. What I want you to do when you've decided on your image is to decide what in that image you want to represent and whether it be your own artistic uh, interpretation of what you're seeing. Thank you very much. Those are some of the choices. The artistic um, interpretation of what you want to see, or if you want to try to draw it, um, reproduce it, you know, really accurately. At this point, it's all up to you as to how you want to express yourself here. And I'm hoping that you won't be shy about jumping in because I myself am not a, an artist, but I love this activity and I love seeing what um, students and the leaders when I do these professional development workshops uh, come up with. I mean, some of it just, it, it moves me because it's wonderful. And I love to see people express themselves and observe and learn something and create beautiful things. So. Um, or very expressive things, most importantly. So, uh, uh, Leslie, Lori has a question. Are all the pictures are on the screen right now on the Martian much. surface? They are. Yeah. They are. Um, some of them are the actual color. Some are in black and white. You'll remember that if they're in black and white, that brings out the um, the differences in light and dark and uh, helps us understand shapes really well. Um, and some of them are in color that is not the actual color of Mars. And I think by now you guys might be able to recognize those. And we also had uh, someone with their hand raised. So if you have a question or comment, you can open up the chat box and put that in there or put it in the Q&A. And even if you don't have a question, we've had questions asked and answered, so everybody can read those. And what I'd like you guys to do is um, to consider 
uh, we're going to open it up for any questions that you might have um, about anything in implementing that the activities. We're going to let you draw for another five minutes or so here. And um, if you're comfortable, we'd love to see what you come up with. If you know, we can allow you um, to show on camera what your beautiful art piece is like and tell us a little bit about what you see in that image and what you decided to feature. So we're gonna let you draw and be standing by for questions. And I know we have some young people with us today um, and that's wonderful. Uh, keep in mind that these uh, first few sessions are really designed for adults, uh, our staff members for our out of school time. Um, if you're a young person, you're, you're welcome to, to hang out with us, but uh, we are looking for our adult participants to be sharing their, uh, their artwork. So uh, if, you have, if you are an adult participant and you are willing to share your artwork in a little bit, if you would raise your hand and I can promote you to that, just remember that your, um, your participation will be recorded. So uh, you know, your artwork will go down in history. <laughs> I see some good questions, um, some technical questions coming in. Um, one from Leah who asks us, can you tell us more about the sensors and the electromagnetic spectrum. I think, Oda, that maybe in future um, workshops, you might cover this a little bit more in depth. And there's plenty of things that you guys can go online to research about this. But briefly, light is part of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. The sun, um, our light bulbs, uh, LEDs, they all emit um, electromagnetic radiation. It just so happens that the frequencies, as we call it, the wavelengths that, um, that uh, they admit, particularly in the case of our own light bulbs, are what we can see. Our eyes detect a small portion of the uh, whole electromagnetic spectrum. Other parts of the le electromagnetic spectrum include um, um, microwaves like you use um, in your home. Uh, there's also radio waves um, to transmit things over the air. Of course, there's cell phone towers, all different kinds of wavelengths, some of which we can perceive and some of which we have to have instruments to be able to perceive. And as um, she was asking, um, we design our instruments to be able to pick up um, either the reflections of the light that's being shined off, for example, from the sun, or in some cases, uh, the actual radiation that's coming from the surface of something. Um, other examples of the electromagnetic spectrum are x-rays, when you go get an x-ray, um, things like that. So um, our instruments are designed specifically to pick up on different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum that can tell us what we need to know. It helps with, for example, not only what it looks like, but the temperature, um, what the surface is made of and so forth. Is there another question? Sorry, Leslie, I know I'm supposed to be monitoring this. I'm typing answers quickly. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, Carrie's wondering, and this actually, may, I'm going to say this out loud so everybody can answer. Any good uh, fiction for middle school age um, kids on Mars with relevant science? So glad for Leslie and Oda's suggestions or any of the other folks can uh, chime in on the chat with their book suggestions about Mars for middle schoolers. I'll speak up on, on one um, that is one of my favorites. It may be a little advanced for some middle school readers, but the story of The Martian, 
I would, that book, it was also a movie. I would highly recommend. They were staying very true to the science for the most part in that movie. The only thing that was a little bit, um, pushed things a little is the opening scene with the windstorm on Mars. And as Oda was telling you earlier, there's hardly any uh, atmosphere on Mars, especially kind of, so it would be really hard to have a windstorm strong enough to blow over uh, um, a spacecraft or anything like that on the surface. It would leave a lot of dust though. Zinn is also wondering what they should be drawing, if you have any inspiration. Uh, you can draw anything that moves you in any interpretation. If you want to look at some of the images that are on the screen, for example, and just draw the shapes that you see to get you familiar. The whole point is to really observe things very closely and both artists and scientists have to do that. So you're developing both those um, potential future uses with the um, skill of observing. And I see uh, Robert's question. Um, you mentioned oxygen generation as part of this mission. Is this being done by breaking down the CO2 of the Martian atmosphere or is it being generated independently? Robert, you're right on. It is being uh, generated by breaking down the CO2. It's an instrument called MOXIE, M-O-X-I-E, which is uh, an acronym uh, that is uh, kind of explanatory. <laughs> but if you, uh, if you look up uh, MOXIE, you'll see what it's doing. It's, it's kind of a, a cool little chemistry experiment. So Leslie, we have a volunteer Let's for sharing their art. Yeah. Um, let me... Uh, Go ahead and Alyssa, thank you for um, volunteering and promoting you to panelist. And I am gonna have you go ahead and unmute. And hey, there you are, awesome. And hey. hold on, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I can't see you guys, oh, there we go. All right. And I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna spotlight you so you show up big for everyone. Go ahead and show us what you have and, and explain, tell us where you're from and uh, explain what you're going to show us. Sure. So I am from Carlsbad, New Mexico. Um, and going into the activity, I was like, oh my God, I don't have a lot of color. Um, I only have black and blue. And so I was like, well, there's a reason why I only have black and blue. Um, so I started to go deeper into my drawing and more into just what I felt about Mars and just what I've learned from you guys. And one big thing that I got from Mars was that there was once water and we're kind of wondering why maybe there's not as much water or water at all. So you can still hear me, correct? Yes. yes. You're doing great. Yes. Okay. So, so I thought, well, what if it's, supposed to be precious what if mars is supposed to teach us the simplicity of life and peace and um you know just being being as far as it is from the sun the sun can still provide us a lot of nutrients um even if we didn't have water or food naturally already on earth the sun itself can help the body. Um, so I thought, well, what if everything is just precious on Mars? And what if we just kind of have to like find it in, in the craters or in the mountains? And so that's kind of what I saw in my own vision. Um, and that's where I got this drawing from. Um, so as you can see that I put one kind of black hole and there's a lot of water. Mm. So there is a lot of water um, on Mars and maybe it is just precious and maybe we have to bring some from earth, you know, in the childlike form. I don't know. Um, especially from the little bit of information that I've received, but there is one dark spot that I put there and it's almost like crystals and gems and stones, correct? Like on earth, they're precious, but they're powerful. We have crystals in our phones and things because they amplify, um, whatever you put through it. So if you put hate through, it's going to amplify. If you put love through, it's going to amplify. So just like 
same thing with signal. If you put signal through, it's going to amplify. So I put the dark spot there. I was guided to put the dark spot there because maybe there's even more precious um, places and things on Mars underneath. And maybe Mars is just kind of playing with us and letting us see the surface. Um, And I don't know if we've actually gone deeper into Mars or if we're currently doing that. But um, something tells me that there's a lot of precious things on Mars and probably in the transition of kind of what's going on on Earth um, and preparing for humans. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I I love that you you worked with what you had. Like you didn't have a whole palette, but you made it work. And I I love the um, the visualization of, of precious water being precious. I mean, water is even precious here on earth, even though we, we feel like we have a lot. We, those of us who live in, in the West, especially, we know that water is very precious and, and somewhat scarce at times. So uh, thank you for sharing that. I, uh, you, your question about uh, whether we've gone into the surface, we, not, we haven't really gotten much into the surface. We've dug a little bit, um, but one of the, um, instruments on this rover is called RIMFAX and it is a ground penetrating radar and so we will be able to see below the surface uh, a little ways with radar and so we'll hopefully know more uh, about the under underneath side of Mars but thank you so much for sharing Alyssa I really appreciate that you're welcome I do believe that Mars is probably like from the inside in that maybe in the inside is beautiful. There's definite life and the outside is just kind of like, oh, well, come on in guys. So yeah, I don't know. Something's telling me. Yeah, we have a lot to learn. I love you. Yeah, we do. And I love your sense of wonder because that's exactly what, you know, it takes to start exploring. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And I look forward to learning more. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Oda and Leslie, uh, Ryan in the chat was asking if you, if there's uh, the ice on Mars, is it possible there could be life there? Um, you know what? It, it's, it is possible. Um, we don't know where we might find life. Um, obviously, we look to follow the water because here on Earth, we Uh, We know that life can exist in places where there is water. So um, yeah, and we know that in Antarctica, we found these little worms in the ice in Antarctica, which is like super weird and cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And things that are found in these extreme environments, we call them extremophiles. So it's possible that there is life in the ice. And wouldn't that be neat? (laughs) So um, could we go on? I want to have a little discussion. I, I'm sorry we don't have time to share more of those. Um, but, I, but I think what she showed us was a wonderful thing that you can ask the kids to do. Um, just speak to what that image says to them and what they were able to observe and draw. That was just a fabulous example. Loved it. Um, so I want to talk with you guys very briefly about... Um, the adaptations, this activities that we're presenting for the most part during this series of training are aimed at upper elementary or uh, high school, or excuse me, junior high aged kids. And so I know there were some of you who um, are teaching out of that range a little bit. Um, So I'd like to see um, your ideas. I have a few suggestions here how you might adapt what we did today for kids that um, might have um, special needs or kids that are a little bit younger um, or things that um, that um, will be a challenge to some of your students. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on that in the chat. One of my suggestions is, for example, if you're going to work with the little ones, they they know their shapes. And so you can simply use these images to have them match, um, you know, or identify the shapes that they see in them. And then you can help them understand what it is they're looking at. Um, You can have them um, see, notice things about shadows because they're learning about shadows, Um, colors. 
Um, they're learning to identify colors and expand their range of colors. So that's something you can you can do um, with the little kids and um, help them get enthusiastic about Mars at the same time. I know they're looking at another world. For some of the older kids, you can get into really trying to analyze. Um, you can do a lot of inter internet research to try to understand what we're learning on Mars. Um, you can help them uh, understand what's going on in the images. Uh, older kids need to know about um, processes that happen on Earth. Well, as it turns out, same process has happened on other planets too, which is awesomely cool. And um, the um, one thing that's in this image here on the right that just blows me away is that our um, we captured an image of an actual landslide and this is the cloud that you see coming out, out of the actual landslide when the picture was taken on Mars. It's pretty amazing. Someone said they uh, saw a lesson where you take a mound of flour. Ah, yes. Make a crater. You take um, a tray of flour and you cover it with cocoa, a thin layer of cocoa, and then you, you can drop a small um, ball or golf ball or rock um, from a distance and mimic making your own crater. We do have that activity. So I'm glad you pointed that out. That's a fun one. And then they can interpret uh, different kids groups um, order of when the different things were dropped if the craters overlap each other. Pretty neat. Uh, thank you, Amelia's put it in there. Any other thoughts about um, how you might wanna adapt this? What I'd like to do now is um, have you guys, since we're gonna close out, um, see that I do have a blog that I do for the Boost Collaborative, the um, for out of school time. Um, and I would highly recommend taking a look at those. I like to feature things that are going on in space there and um, you can follow along with that. Um, that's just twice a year. So it's a, a big you know, summary of what's, what's coming up in space and what activities you can do to, to go along with it. And um, on the next slide, if um, Amelia doesn't mind telling us really quickly about um, our host yeah. today, the Museum and Informal Education Alliance from NASA. Yeah, great. So everybody on this call, unless you signed up within the last two minutes, uh, should have gotten an email from me letting you know about my alliance. It's designed for informal educators, and we invite all informal educators to join. It is, of course, free. And the idea is that it helps you navigate NASA because NASA is very huge. And we know that you, if you were looking for things specific for informal education um, venues, you, you might want a little help. So um, this just slide gives you a little bit of information what we offer and you can go to that link and I will put that in the chat as well. And again, this is for informal educators. So professionals in camps, out of school time, after school programs and whatnot. I know we have some families on the line. Um, there are different resources for families that I also sent out to them who had registered. Glad to answer any questions that come up in the chat. And Noda, I think we're done. If you want to close this out. All right. Well, thank you all for participating. I really appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, go.nasa.gov slash Mars dash challenge has all the activities. You can sort by grade level. You can um, uh, look at what's available for each of the seven weeks of the challenge. Um, and you don't have to do it for seven weeks. You could do it for seven days or five days. You can, you can use as little or as much of the challenge as you want, whatever works for your particular uh, kiddos that, that we really want your, whatever works for your environment. We want everything to, uh, to go ahead and, and, and work for you. Um, that's, that's what's important for us. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and encourage you to join us for the coming sessions of professional development that will address the rest of the weeks of the Mission to Mars Student Challenge Summer Camp Edition. And as a special treat, here are a couple of pictures that our participant Frances from Ireland shared with us. These are images of her Art in the Cosmic Connection art 
on cloth, which is yet another opportunity for engaging your students.